Hello, it's Scott Manley here with another part of my tutorial uh, educational you know, first timer series. This is entirely stock. We are going to Duna and we are on our final approach. So I'm just using manual time acceleration here to go in because I've learned not to trust the warp to <laughs> switch. I've had too many times when it has failed me at an inopportune moment. And when the time acceleration, or when the warp 2 fails you on approach to an object, things are happening very, very quickly and you do not have much time to uh, fix them. Now you'll notice, by the way, that the, the vector kind of switches through almost like 120 degrees. So that's because we're switching from velocity relative to the sun to velocity relative to Duna. And if I look... There, there it is. So we're essentially going straight towards it. This is like almost 90 degrees, well, more than 90 degrees to my current motion. But uh, there it goes. Yo, you can see Ike just orbiting around it there as well. On the, It's on the right-hand side. And swiftly moving around to come in front of Duna. And there, that's us transitioning sphere of influence. So now we're inside Duna's sphere of influence. Our three patches that we'll see is the initial approach, encounter with Ike, and then post-encounter with Ike. So we can see that we're not in fact going to crash into Duna, which is a good sign, but perhaps it's time to make a little bit of a trim maneuver. Okay, I think it would be nice to make a little bit of a trim maneuver here, but sometimes on highly hyperbolic orbits you will encounter this particular problem. It doesn't really matter because all I, all I want to do is move the move the orbits closer to uh, closer to Duna, and to do this, I have to find the the relative uh, the radial vector, and I think that's the radial vector, or it might be the anti radial vector. Let's find out. I'm gonna fire the engines and watch my approach. Ah, yes, no, that was the anti radial vector. Anti radial means it's pointing away from the center of the the orbit except there's not really it's pointing at uh, 90 degrees to the orbit coplanar with being away from uh, look it just pushes you away from the orbit this one pushes you closer so we're going to try and get ourselves close enough that we might consider aero braking so to aero brake you want to bring your periapsis down to like 20 kilometers or less it depends on how aggressive you want to be if you go too low there is a chance you will be torn up by your re-entry forces if you go too high, then you might not get captured at all. Most spacecraft don't actually use aero braking until after they've performed their initial capture burn, so I'm, I'm not sure what I'm going to do here, there's a lot of options, and I do actually have a ton of fuel. Also, since we've just achieved this and we've been out in space, it's worth going and checking the contracts because you might find that there's some new stuff to uh, visit certain locations around the, the Duna system, but no, no, we are completely out of luck here, so never mind. Back into deep space with the Duna Explorer. Of course, we've been neglecting the station in orbit around the moon, but that's fine. There we go. So now we can start collecting our science. There's going to be a ton of science to collect. We are in high Duna configuration, which means the experiments that will work will be mystery goo. We would get potentially a materials bay, but I think I'm not sure about whether to use this. I'm going to transmit it nevertheless. Uh, we also will have uh, temperature. Temperature works in deep, deep space, and that's all very interesting. And air pressure, which is, of course, a vacuum. Uh, that was that was largely added so people could get more science. Initially, or previously, you couldn't take pressure readings outside the atmosphere, but for some reason it was decided that that was counterproductive to only have it restricted. I don't know why, because it's not as if the game wasn't lacking science. So now we're going to go in and we're going to get nice and close to Ike. I haven't adjusted my Ike approach. I've just adjusted my final orbit relative to Duna, right? So it might be that we pass really close to Ike, or it might be that we don't pass very close at all. As I always think it's rather beautiful to watch these things spinning around each other. It's times like this that I am, well, I am found to wax poetic about the infinite ballet of spacecraft orbiting and things like that. Here we go, and Ike is coming our way once again. I think we're just going to, we're, we're not going to get anywhere near Ike, so we're only going to get high altitude science over Ike. 
And there is the transition to uh, Ike's sphere of influence and therefore a new domain from which I can collect science. I think I'm really only going to be collecting the... Uh, once again, I'm going to be collecting temperature and I'm going to be collecting pressure. These are just going to be transmitted home. So because I'm transmitting them, I'm only getting a fraction of their yield, in this case 50%. And uh, you can't just immediately retake it and get another 50% science. You actually have to return the science experiment or return the data. So you need a return trip if you want all the best data. But it doesn't matter. This is a long way from home and it's getting a lot of science on account of Duna being much higher ranked in terms of science difficulty. If we want near Ike science, we have to get within 50 kilometers. And although I'm still going downwards, I suspect that I am not going to get within even 100 kilometers of Ike. It's going to pass by silently below us. Yeah, look, we're not going to get nearly close enough for this. I could have adjusted that on the way in. There'd definitely be a way for me to get both bits of science. But there's another thing that I want to do here. I'm going to I'm going to just uh, realize I don't want an aero break on this pass. And since we're as close as we're going to get, I can just test this just in case. So I, you know, basically log temperature and it tells me that we are still high over Ike. That means I'm not going to waste one of these goo canisters here. So I've only got, I've only got three for the descent, right? So that's, a, you know, high, medium and low for the descent. I need one goo canister for low Duna orbit. So there's no goo left for Ike, unfortunately. Oh, look, we're passing into the shadow. Once again, the cosmic ballet continues, and we feel the chill as the sun is removed from our uh, solar panels or something. Okay, so we're going to now just leave the sphere of influence of Ike, and we're going to make some uh, post-encounter maneuvers. So I've got this set up for aero braking, but I think I'm going to change my plans here. The reason is that I don't want to actually land on the dark side right now. It'd be nice to have some notion of being able to get electrical power and things like that. So I want to make sure that I'm doing this on the correct side. Because I might actually have a problem during descent or whatever. So I'm going to fire my engines. Now what way am I going to fire my engines? Actually, no, I was pointing the right direction initially, I think. Just going to put it just about here. I want to slow my orbit just a little. So we put it halfway between the retrograde vector and the anti-radial vector. And now bring this up above 50 kilometers because 50 kilometers is the altitude at which Duna's atmosphere finishes. And then I'm going to perform the capture maneuver here. We're just going to put it into a highly eccentric orbit. Now, once you're in the captured orbit, then you can perform the aero braking over successive orbits. You, you know, if you've got a highly eccentric orbit and you're dipping into the atmosphere at one end, then that tends to circularize your orbit. So it's actually, it's not really used for landers, right? It does get used for orbiters around Mars. And what they do is, again, highly eccentric orbit and then successive casual, like slow, low impact aero braking maneuvers and they can perform, they can get themselves into a more circular orbit before they finally you know correct it into a circular orbit with a final engine burn. Anyway, I'm just collecting all this science here because we have so much science to collect. This is where we burn all our experiments, including the coveted materials uh, exposure bay. The exposure bay is just a big ass ugly experiment that becomes very. It becomes hard for it not to dominate your entire spacecraft design because it's as big as a fuel tank. And I just realized I was rather foolish. I transmitted all of that science while I was in the dark side. So there was a not insignificant chance that I could entirely run out of power and not be able to perform my injection burn until later. But it looks like I have enough. So pointing the spacecraft retrograde and I'm just going to burn until my orbit becomes captured. Here we go. Fire up that engine. Watch Ike setting here. Now, if you're going to put yourself into orbit around Ike, uh, so around Duna, you pretty much have to make sure your orbit does not cross that of Ike's. Ike's is Ike is one of the biggest moons relative to its parent body, and while the chance of encounter with something like the regular moon uh, around Kerbin is rare, you're almost certainly going to encounter Ike several times. If yeah, so there we go. And we get into a polar orbit. I shall have to exploit this for profit.
Okay, so I cut out about half an hour of faffing around with maneuver nodes trying to get a perfect capture maneuver and instead I performed, I took that maneuver node that I had and worked it up a little. So we're going to fly past uh, Ike and it will project us into an orbit, ideally, which will bring us over the poles and then let me continue to an actual descent maneuver. So we're going to get within 50 kilometers. And once I'm within 50, I shall be able to collect the true science, the true heart of Ike. Ike is tidally locked to Duna, and it, which means it keeps one side always to Duna. And also, it is in a geostationary orbit, or a Duna stationary orbit. So let's log this temperature, send that backwards, log the atmosphere, log, or log the pressure, send that backwards. And that's all we can do. So now we're going to continue out the other side. You see, what this has done is it's kicked our orbit downwards. And perhaps I can exploit this to put myself into an even more interesting orbit. I'm, what I really want to do is get one that gets me really, really close to the daytime side of Duna here. And... Yeah, I'm just trying to think. If, if I burn the engine in any particular way, I don't think this is going to work. I think I'm just going to perform a burn here. I have... I think I have enough fuel left. I'm just going to bring it down over the poles. Now, one of the advantages of this is I, I have a rover, and I want to put the spacecraft, or I want to put the lander, very close to the boundary between one or more biomes. Now, without the, the cheat biome map, uh, I have to kind of visually assess where the biomes are. And hitting a target from this far away is kind of hard. However, if you look at Duna, it has those polar caps that are nice and white. So if I land very close to the edge of the poles, then it hopefully will be driving distance to go from one pole to the other. Oh, that is not what I expected. What the heck? 33 kilometers. That would be a very nice orbit, but I suspect... Let me just see this. Yes, okay. It was confused as to what sphere of influence it was in. Okay, so set this maneuver back up again. Oh, dear. Oh, the chores of navigation in space. So, yeah, bring that down. And so we're going to come over the North Pole, slow down in the atmosphere, and then hopefully land as close to that border as possible so that I have two different biomes to visit for the price of one. And actually, because of the way the biome system works, probably three because the transitions between biomes do tend to be a little glitchy and sometimes re result in a third unrelated biome. Start or my descent burn. And now I'm hoping I have enough fuel here to perform this. Uh, this thing if you remember has had about 1.2 left after the initial inject initial burn to Duna. So great. Oh no look that's pretty darn close to zero fuel here. I think this was a really, really well-judged maneuver. Okay, so I cut out a bit of experimentation there. Basically, I wanted to pick a suitable altitude that would put me close to the border. And the only real way to do that without mods is to save and reload. Now, uh, you can consider that cheating if you like, but it looks a whole lot nicer if I can actually just show you this whole thing working as it was intended. Okay, so we're going to ditch that now. And we have our engines online. We're going to turn the whole thing straight uh, downstream. The heat shield is there, but it largely helps with stability. We, yeah, No, we're not in the atmosphere yet. We've got to get down below 50, don't we? But we're going to want to make sure we turn the correct way around. Yeah, at this velocity, the heat shield really isn't going to make that much difference. But it will help with making sure that nothing else gets subjected to the extra heat. In retrospect, I probably should have made that other spacecraft autonomous so that I could have left it in a parking orbit and had it do interesting science or something. But this thing's going down. Getting atmospheric science now. We do the atmospheric scan. The atmospheric scan takes a lot of data to send back. Mystery goo. I observe the goo. I'm not sure how I observe the goo since I'm not there. We're going to leave the doors on this closed. Uh... And yeah, so 1.3 kilometers per second. That heat shield is largely going to be there for a show, I guess. So now I'm hoping that this will take me down 
either, well, right along the border of the polar ice cap there. And as I said, I tested this a few times. From this orbit, it needed to be about 23 kilometers. Certainly, you know, it didn't matter how steep you went in, as long as you didn't uh, have a, as long as your periaps didn't intersect with the surface, you would be able to slow down sufficiently. Be aware, though, that at the, over the poles, the mountains are quite high. The what happens in Kerbal Space Program is the gradient tends to make the mountains higher. If you have a steep gradient, then the mountains get higher and higher. And because the pole, the distances are artificially compressed due to the projection, it does mean that you tend to have very steep and much higher mountains at the poles, just, for, just so you know. Of course, that isn't true in Kerbin, where we have nice, flat terrain, but... <laughs> Now we've slowed down enough, we've slowed down to about four and a half, or 450 metres per second. Before we deploy the parachutes, we want to be moving sufficiently slowly. If you watch the low-density supersonic decelerator experiment, you'll see that the parachute tore off well. You're going to have the same phenomenon here, potentially. I mean, it depends on how it's set up, but I want to get down below 250 because I was told by developers that that is their target speed for parachute deployment. You might find out that in the thin atmosphere of Duna that you're not slowing down sufficiently quickly, so it's perfectly valid to deploy those engines and slow yourself down. 260, 250, I don't know how high we are. Let's start using those engines a little, just to make sure that we don't hit the ground too fast. Those engines are going to make sure that we are moving slowly enough so that when the parachutes deploy fully, that we they have time to slow us down. Now, I'm going to open that up so it'll, since it'll add a little bit of drag, since all that stuff will now be contributing correctly to drag. But also, there are science experiments on that that I would like to uh, actually perform. Okay, so now we're moving at about 10 meters per second, 11. Okay, so collect all this science from the air before we touch down on the ground. This is our chance, and we should have another one of these goo experiments here. Right, so I've not transmitted any of this science because it's going to start taking power away if I was to transmit it. And I want to make sure my power doesn't go to zero during a descent. So I'm going to bring the speed down to under six meters per second. That's the impact threshold for a lot of objects. And we have tons of fuel here. Like, I think this was quite well judged. And bingo. Touchdown off the Luna, of the Duna lander. So we're going to, of course, collect science, transmit science. We have a ton of science to transmit, and you don't need to sit and watch this. So we shall come back to the further adventures of the Duna Rover in the next episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.